All right, welcome back. We are INFR 3335U, that's Social and Multiplayer Game Design in the Fall 2021 semester at Ontario Tech University. And it's week six of our lecture, part one of our broadcast, and we're talking about mobile game design fundamentals uh, as well. We're this In this particular broadcast, we're also gonna be uh, hosting our guest lecturer, Mark Samuel LeBlanc, who's gonna be talking about his experiences with playtesting. So let's move on to our schedule. We'll just do a little bit of what's on right now, what's happening and uh, where we're moving just to keep everyone on track, just like normal. So we're sitting at week six. We're you know kind of in the week of October 20th. And this week we're talking about mobile, mobile game fundamentals as well as interface design for mobile games. We're gonna do a brief introduction into the world of games user research, which is gonna tie into what you're doing uh, next semester uh, with a full-blown course. Again, we can't, of course, uh, you know, go through all the details that you'll be dealing with in that course, but we're going to give you a bit of a preview and how that can help us design mobile games. Um, again, a couple of things that are still outstanding. Next week, Project Part 2, a second playable, uh, which is with your WebGL build. That'll be due at the end of the week. I'll give you more details of that by Friday. And um, I'll also give you more information about your assignment three. I want you to think about what you're doing with assignment three, which is going to be building your own game system. So we'll talk about that in brief uh, today. All right. So that is uh, where we're at in terms of our schedule. Uh, the last week we were together, you were doing your midterm exam. And there were two components, your theoretical component as well as your practical component. I was talking with the uh, TA ticket today. We were working on the problem you guys had during your tutorial on Monday. And uh, he was saying that his uh, theoretical, sorry, his practical component should be mostly done uh, by the end of the week. And same thing with me. I should have everything up for you guys by the weekend so that you should be all up to date and know where you stand from a course perspective with all the marking and everything done. So that's coming up this weekend. Um, so what are we doing this week? Like we said, our, we're going to start with our guest lecturer. He's going to be talking about playtesting, and then we're going to do a bunch more stuff. Intro to GUR, uh, Games User Research, again, to be continued next semester in more depth. Uh, UX Design for Mobile Games. What is UX Design? We're going to be talking about that. Uh, play Heuristics, just a small bit of Play Heuristics. And we're also going to be talking about Nielsen's Heuristics, just a bit. Uh, mobile game design fundamentals. What are they? What do you need? Uh, what is the magic interface? You may have seen the magic interface before, but we're going to be talking about it again, as well as how to fix your mobile game build process in Unity from Unity to LD Player. I'll try and deal all that kind of stuff uh, by the end of today. And so what's due this week in class exercise three, that's due Friday. And again, just on the horizon, assignment three is due week eight. But there's also one thing that I didn't mention here in this little PowerPoint, which is your project part two. And again, I'll have all that ready for you, the details of what I'm looking for from that uh, by the end of the week, okay? So that's what's happening. I'm gonna go right into our guest lecture now. So I'm gonna stop talking and stop uh, sharing. I'm also gonna enable our friend here to be able to share. Just a second here, Mark, while I give you all kinds of power, right? Because that's how it's going to be. Hold on a second here, guys, as we start. I will make our friend a co-host so he'll have the power to, you know, create kingdoms and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Here we go. And I'll stop talking and I'll let our friend uh, share his screen and talk about what he's doing uh, for today. Mark, whenever you're ready, take it away. Sounds good. Can you hear me, Tom? Absolutely. Thank you. Wonderful. That's good. Uh, I'm just going to see if sharing the screen is going to work. Should be able to do it, no problem. Let's see what happens. Right. We have a couple people on YouTube right now waiting for all this stuff to happen. 
And while Mark's getting ready, again, um, super excited to get into the second half. We've got all kinds of things uh, that we're going to be doing uh, together. And the most uh, most interesting part is how you're going to build your own game system in assignment uh, three and four, which is kind of interesting, which is really assignment two, uh, part one and two. All right. So let's uh, hopefully Mark will be able to come up with that stuff. Worst case, yeah. Mark, if you can't, then I will. Yeah, I got it. I'm just going to do this. Let me know if you can see that. Not yet. Oh, there we go. You're good to go. All right. Thank you, Mark. Do you have a full screen? You don't have anything else obscuring anything? That's it. You're full. Testing allows for people to use wildly different levels of creativity and behavior to interact and help define what works and what does not. And play style and personality behavior correlate significantly. Um, and I know that uh, that may seem difficult to understand um, playing a lot of digital stuff, but uh, I'll get into more later. Um, balancing challenge versus skill. This figure here illustrates the various mental states that can be experienced based on your perceived you skill and challenge level levels within a gaming, gaming system. system. Hopefully, Hopefully, a player will start out with a healthy joy, joy for playing, playing and the desire to truly see what they can accomplish while testing a new system. system. It's totally dependent upon what's brought to the table by both the designer or game master and the other players. The encounter must be of sufficient skill level across a variety of players in order to engage them and work harmoniously with the system design in order to, to attain a state of flow. So you're starting out perhaps with a low challenge level and a high skill level, you're going to have very relaxed players. Uh, you know, let's move onwards. What is flow? The ideal state of mind for a game. Bear with me a second, guys. I'm having a technical issue. I need to move something a little bit and get back to there. There we go. Okay. Flow is the ideal state of mind for a game. Uh, the player's skill and challenge are in perfect balance, leading to deep engagement and satisfaction. Although good games make it possible for players to enter a state of flow, no game can achieve this state 100% of the time, which leads to some of the other positive states of arousal, control, relaxation, I can tell you that across many different game masters, your professor included, or diving into a game of destiny for six hours online, being in that state of flow is what keeps me coming back to the table or my controller after storming off angrily over a perceived injustice in the game being played. Playtesting out those moments means that a state of flow can happen more often and keep players willing to do whatever it takes to stay there. How to get there. I do not personally believe that a game design is an egocentric exercise, although I have seen GMs who make it out to be that. Creating an organic reactive system requires input from different perspectives and ability levels for a designer to transform it into a game that engages everyone. The whole point is to make the game fun for everyone. There is nothing like getting together around a table or online with a group of friends, old and new, and having fun playing a game. Something as subjective as fun, though, creates a conundrum for people who prefer to bury their head in mathematics and probabilities. Balance, balance is key, and I think that balance is achieved through playtesting. And having admittedly been the most difficult player at the table, 
at many tables <laughs> for 30 years, my behavioral pattern of testing understanding, seeking to establish whether or not an earlier contribution has been understood, has often put game designers on the defensive. Ultimately, though, my very difficult behavior ended up ensuring that a lot of kinks were ironed out and that the fundamental math and rules incongruities, which are big cognitive sticking points for me, were smoothed out. Imagine putting yourself through the nine hells of Bator repeatedly so that in the end you reached that state of flow, forgetting that hell ever existed. And yes, you can see Dante's Inferno for the inspiration or most Dungeons and Dragons players' manuals or GM manuals about that inspiration. Balance through playtesting a little bit more. Breaking the system is not the point of playtesting. Players will do that enough even years into playing a set system. Min-maxers tend to detract from the playtesting phase, which is all about collaboration and finesse. I would rather a playtester argue a point on the language of the rule so that it becomes clear for anyone who would set about reading it than set out to prove it wrong from the start. Clear, precise descriptions of what worked and what did not work help lay out the structure for an evenly balanced game that can handle those extreme situations or players. Moving on. Trial and error. Now, this is a big section, trial and error. Your professor will probably use fancy names for it. He might use the word heuristics. It's trial and error. <laughs> That's, I'm, not a, I'm not a fancy mathematics kind of guy. Um, but you know, with respect to enduring play, it can't be repetitive or boring. And for example, I watched Tom and his friend play Valheim when it came out, spending endless hours cutting down trees or mining stones. And I was bored to tears not my kind of game. Uh, failure within the game doesn't mean game over. The, the game designer has to find options for people to move forward, and that is tested out. No loss of items with a personal attachment. In a game that I played for many years, I have an item called the Shadow Blade. It is dear to me. Anybody tried to take that away from me, any GM tried to fool around with things and get funny on me, I would lose my stuff and, 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 and walk away from the table. Uh, uh, the game can really go on forever. And, and, and that's more of an open world concept, whether digital or, or uh, uh, a role-playing game. Uh, lastly, players should be given a forum to voice their challenges or explain how the game has them in a state of apathy or boredom as shown in the skill and challenge level ch chart that I showed earlier, thus allowing for the GM to inject variety and pace that brings more engagement. The next section, variety in player and game. I touched on it a little bit earlier, but playtesting with a variety of players ensures the game will attract a broad spectrum of users to the finished product. Offering a variety of ways to obtain an objective or goal ensures nobody walks away empty handed, feeling time was wasted. Playtesting takes the opening hook of a game and puts it to task. Is everyone engaged? Why not? What can be done better? Everyone's input matters. Transparency, and this is very important to me because of my understanding of, of behavioral awareness of people, especially while playing, transparency in the experience among different skill levels of players creates a psychological safe zone and promotes a team culture that pushes the play forward, regardless, again, if it's digital or if it's role playing. Agency continued, one of the biggest issues Sorry, I went, skipped ahead a little bit. Playtesting proves out very quickly whether you are playing in a minecart on rails or a world of endless possibilities. I know right away if I'm in control or if I'm playing a part in a movie that I did not want to be in. And over the years, it's happened more often than you, you really would want it to. To my experience, in the many players I have sat beside or across a table from, just very few just want to put their hand on the wall and follow it around until they catch up to where they started again. To test the boundaries of the system and world created is one thing, but to be able to create and add to that world and watch it grow into something more is a very special privilege. Uh, in a game that one of your other instructors, Daryl Olson, uh, uh, played for many years or GM for many years, you know, I was able to build a, a floating airy squadron of, you know, attack, aerial attack fighters uh, out of dwarven stone that floated uh, you know, that had a pocket dimension built into it. And all of that became part of the world that he had developed. So it's, you know, it's a very special privilege to be able to contribute like that. 
one of the biggest issues I've seen come up time and again is when a player feels they have no freedom to act as they wish in a game. Good game design allows for people to act out their desires and fail or succeed and learn from it in order to move forward in their character's development. Only playtesting a system will ensure that this crucial aspect of playing is enshrined in the system. The reason it's crucial is because the players will feel that they are in control of what is happening versus being marionettes to the GM. Next, emotional connection. You would never have gotten me to play test a game like Resident Evil or Call of Cthulhu in their developmental stages. As a child growing up with night terrors, the idea of playing a game that would immediately invoke those difficult memories was a fast no. Take a rousing story by a beloved author and turn that into a game, Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian, and you've got me hook, line, and sinker. My emotional buy-in to creating this RPG enabled me to see past any horror elements added in as the game system was tested and fleshed out. I was emotionally invested in my character, the world, and the story. The cool factor. Using that very same game as the stage for this section, doing something new with subject matter like Conan had me chomping at the bit versus the standard of D&D at the time. The role-playing world would only have had the 2004 Mongoose Games version to start from, but we had taken that subject and had a fully play-tested and developed Conan game by 1995. It was that common thread of excitement for a subject matter that we all loved and pushed immense desire into in order to play the kind of game that entertained all of us. Humor. I cannot tell you how many times nor how hard I have laughed and enjoyed time well spent playtesting our Conan role-playing game. From characters of your professors and mine, the short-lived Thack and Thule, Rack and Rule, to Meathead Brothers out to carouse and break heads, to enduring icons of our game, Braku, General of Armies, and Camus, Prefect and Politician with the Ear of the King. No matter how serious the subject matter may have been or what cosmic oozing bubbling horror was thrown at us by the GM, Braku would scream his own name like a battle cry, clap my bald head, and I would lose my, my brain laughing hysterically for hours. Immersion. Sound alone plays in such an integral part to the gaming process, whether it be a song as described below or an earworm like Sabathun's song in Destiny. To this day, no matter what game system we play, throwing on the soundtrack from Conan the Barbarian at the beginning of a battle always puts us in the right mood for gaming and getting the job done. The mapping provided by the designer gives the sense of reality and the way the player moves around in it provides the designer with the opportunity to learn about how each player thinks and behaves. To me and my preference for playing, there is nothing like setting up miniatures on a grid map on a table and rolling for initiative. Flexibility. Playtesting helps determine whether or not the rules and processes of the system have the flexibility required to ensure smooth interaction between the player and the GM. Players do not want easy, easy victories. I just spent three hours playing Destiny. None of it was easy and I loved it. <laughs> uh, they want to be challenged but not by hitting their heads against an unbreakable wall. Any GM I have played with will be happy to explain how I react to inflexibility in the rules or in the challenge presented to the group. Right, Tom? Tom? <laughs> Good game systems have play tested enough to ensure there are methods of engagement that cater to all levels of players and that they can withstand the pressures placed upon them. Now, this last section is just a few images that I wanted to show with respect to the last bit to talk about before we get into any kind of questions about playtesting, creativity and design. I wanted to put this image up here because this is the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons character sheet from 1984, 85, 86-ish, you know, and it's very wordy. There's a lot of unnecessary design around the page. There's a lot of information going on here. It's like, you know, it, it, it was just way too much and it didn't really suit our needs for doing something like the Conan game. So I ended up having to teach myself at the time how to do desktop publishing with new systems that were in place with Adobe uh, uh, PageMaker at the time, which has now become Adobe Creative Suite uh, today. Um, and we had to tinker with something like this to move towards the Conan game where, you know, we tried uh, um, hit point 
areas that looked shaped like the body, but pieces weren't fitting the way we wanted them to. And we weren't happy with the space that was allowed for things. Um, and, you know, we had everything else almost the way we wanted it, but then the final result was just simplifying that area of the hip points being done or the hip damage being done to something clean and simple like this. Compared to a lot of words and a lot of unnecessary design to go to something very straightforward and, you know, Tom and I know every single little bit of this inside and out, upside down and backwards, um, but that amount of creativity from play testing the game just looking at the piece of paper and what what is going to work for us just the same as it's going to be on a digital aspect what's going to work what's not going to work how can i make that screen look right and look intuitive to somebody um, and you know we were very happy with the end results so creativity and design with respect to play testing is extremely important and i have no idea how long that took it probably took shorter than it was supposed to, but that's it. Questions. If anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer. Well, that no no that's that's fine that that speaks to one of the sections that i already spoke about with respect to flexibility you know you do have to make it challenging but failure does not mean that, that they can't move forward you know if if somebody fails at that challenge you have to be ready to pivot and move you have to be able to present them with a different way of going about it i've i've had you know tom throw us into situations where we had to and I'm not going to give examples. Don't don't ask. But but uh, you know he does like he does like to to GM a Marvel game that we've played, and he likes to throw situations at us where you know we feel like we're beating our heads against a wall. But then you know what's that over there? Something has opened up for us that wasn't necessarily something we paid attention to before. You have to be ready to on the fly manipulate a situation where you can put them back on track again. I mean, pick a weekend. Did it matter? Uh, <laughs> you know, when you're in that playtesting phase of a new game, uh, I'm, I'm very linguistic. I'm very, um, I like to make sure that the, the wording of something is correct. And if it isn't, I'm going to have a sticking point with it to the point where if you just say to me, well, let's just put this aside and we'll, we'll talk about it next time or we'll talk about it after the game, and I'm not happy with that. I'm going to get them to walk away. I'm just like, no, I need to have it fixed right then and there. That's why I, like, I can't stand waiting for a patch, you know, <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a digital game. It drives me insane, you know, when something's not to my liking. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, Daryl, the, the GM at the time, he would, you know, the, the, the incident with Kane, the, uh, the vampire at the tree, when the tree came crashing down and, you know, killing us all. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, okay, fine. I'm done. I'm out of here. <laughs> Those kinds of things. You know, very, very frustrating, um, you know, at times, especially when you're creating a new system, guys. And, and I think one of the challenges that, that Mark has mentioned here is, you know, things kind of 
they go awry. We're making some new mechanics, something that, that haven't been tested. We're basing it probably on stuff that, that has gone before. We've played, we've done role playing for a while. Okay. At the time when we, when we picked this up, um, you know, we had been role playing for a long time and Dungeons and Dragons, this just not suffice for the game world we were kind of putting together. It just didn't match. You know, Conan was gritty. When, whenever, when, when you read the Conan books, right, they just, it doesn't translate exactly well into D and D. So, so that was the one of the the reasons why you know what the push to to, to develop this thing was, and um, all of us loved the the base material. All right, so that's what it was about. But um, one of the challenges that we had was putting together a realistic system. And Mark kind of showed us uh, kind of those images. Mark, could you pull that up again? The kind of the the last things, the uh, um, the character sheets. One more time. So those sheets were developed based on the mechanics. Remember, this is kind of like an interface in some ways uh, that we're seeing right now in um, when we're when we're playing uh, games today, right? When we have something like um, you know Dark Souls, whatever, we have a character sheet that comes up. It doesn't matter whether it comes up, um, you know, kind of um, here like it is uh, on a, on paper, or you know, kind of in a, in a game system. And there's one section here. Uh, that you may have not noticed. Uh, first of all, the design, the layout of this thing was interesting. Normally, when you see character sheets, doesn't matter where, we don't normally see the the you know the the abilities laid out just like this. And there's a reason for this, not just for fit, but something else. And also, what the heck is this stuff here in the corner? This this stuff on the right hand side. Um, you know, what is all that? What are the body hit locations you've got there? And why are they, what do you think they're important for the Conan game, Mark? Well, we wanted to be as realistic as possible. I mean, I'm a third degree black belt martial artist. You were a martial artist at the time. Um, and, you know, when you're hitting someone, you know, if you hit somebody on the arm, it's not going to matter as much as it would if you're hitting them in the chest. And to make the game realistic, you know, we decided to break this up and to put this kind of thing into play. Uh, and it worked amazingly. It just, you know, it, it, it made it feel like we were in real fight. It's just on tape. It also made it pretty gritty. And one of the things we're going to talk about, uh, maybe not, not this lecture, but in a future lecture is, you know, we went through a lot of iterations of this thing. And... Um, you know, we there's a there's there's a discussion we're going to have later on. We're going to have another guest speaker come on, um, one that you actually all know, um, and it's going to be um, we're going to talk about realism and playability, realism versus playability, and how that can take away from, uh, you know, too much realism might be a bad thing sometimes. So we went through some of these iterations, right? And um, you know, one of the the iterations we went, we went through was how do we create a system where you roll once you're not rolling necessarily different types of dice but that one roll tells us exactly if we hit and where we hit okay so that was kind of something that we had come up with and um it the the thing the the end result that you're seeing here in the in the character sheet seems very simple right notice that the numbers on the left hand side 0 to 9 that's on a 10 sided die so our game um, that we we had created when you roll two sided two ten sided dies you have a percentile dice one of the dies the the tens um, you know will basically help you decide whether you're going to hit or not but the ones die tells you where you hit okay so that was kind of an uh, integral part of our game and we wanted to develop this thing to make it as kind of straightforward as possible so when you, it's it's a one and done. You roll and you know if you hit or not, and you know where you hit. Okay, so that that development took a lot of time to figure that out. Um, you know, we did a lot of things before we got to that point, and um, also the way health was done in this system was very different from the way health is done in Dungeons and Dragons. And you have hit points in Dungeons and Dragons based on a level. Here originally there was no level, right? Here it was a skill-based system. That's something that you have to see here as well. We're talking about a, the next assignment is you developing your own game system. So take a look here. You've got three types of health, superficial, critical, and mortal, 
and that's there for every type of a body hit location that's on the chart here. So a lot of stuff that went into that. And I'm not sure if you want to comment about that, Mark, at all, but... Yeah, I will, actually. I will because uh, the... Uh, the yep. Yeah. Second, those those character sheets are the more pretty ones of the earlier ones. Okay, um, and what I'm going to put up on the screen and hope that you know it's it's legible to some degree is the finalized version. And I'm just going to show that. Well, yeah, it's not going to be, but like the, there were changes done to how superficial, critical, and mortal mortal were, were done. It was also it also became a document that was. On them. I wish you know, I could have taken a picture to post for this, but show one more know, time. Show show it again. I, I've made it. It max. became a, it became a, a multi-folding page document. Yeah, we see it. And if you were talking about skills just now. Skills became on that inside of the document with the different ratings that we gave and the different numbers that you had to achieve by that die roll. Um, again, it, you know. It, just felt like everything worked well with the dice, like the, the, the numbers that we chose to use, the places that we chose to put them, <laughs> the design of everything. You know, it, that, that was after years of testing to get to that point. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Trayton. He says, when creating a brand new system mechanic, how often would you recommend play testing it? Like for us who are making a new game, do you have a recommendation for how often get people together to try it? I mean, yes, you know, when we were doing this in our 20s, <laughs> we were doing this every every weekend. Uh, and, you know, not just, you know, one day on a weekend. It may have, it may have been two or three days of, of a weekend. Uh, but, you know, not everybody has that time, especially in the modern world, uh, the way that every, everything needs to be right now and, and, and uh Everybody needs to be on board. I think that the best you can do nowadays would be once every week, maybe once every two weeks, but like, you know, a couple of hours at a time. And I think when uh, when it comes, guys, to your assignment for your making your mechanic, I think kind of in line with what Mark is saying, you know, you once you start thinking about this game system and the first part of the game system that you're going to be developing is what are the ability scores? right what and and what do the ability scores in the game what what theme are you basing this thing on is it are you trying to adapt or create a game system for a specific type of theme a specific type of genre like for example are your is your game going to be a sci-fi game is it going to be another fantasy game is it going to be some other type of game maybe more of a modern game and really if you think about it, your mechanics your your ability scores uh, for your role-playing game should really reflect the theme and the genre that you're adapting the game for, right? Um, one of the options I'm going to give you and uh, is to base it on a game that already exists. If you want to modify uh, Dungeons & Dragons and make it your own, and by the way, a lot of other companies have done the exact same thing. They've taken Dungeons & Dragons and morphed it, modified it to make it their own. That's okay. That's going to be fine if you take something and add to it or, re or remove something. But once you start doing adds, moves, and changes, it affects all kinds of other, uh, other stuff downstream. So for example, um, our Conan system was very different in terms of combat, right? Why? Because our skills, and again, Mark, if you want to bring up that character sheet one more time, the, the older one up on the PowerPoint, our skills were based on um, our ability scores. So, for example, when you had a skill like, let's suppose I have a skill like uh, a um, some kind of fighting skill, sword skill. That sword skill is going to be probably based on one of the physical abilities or two of the physical abilities. For example, if it's a strength-based weapon, it might be something that's really, really heavy uh, or two-handed for that matter. Uh, example, like a great sword. That would probably be a pure strength weapon. It would have really not so much finesse, right? 
and the type of damage that it would do and the way you would wield it would be different, very different than if you use something like a longsword or a rapier, right? So th that kind of difference, we would have different abilities that would basically uh, set up a success number that you would have to meet. And the way that would work is, let's suppose, and by the way, just more details about the way we, what we did when we created this uh, this this system, um, the ability scores ranged from five to fifty, where fifty was godlike, <laughs> and five was very very bad. It was very like, almost no one had that. That would be someone who's you know, uh, who's disabled or something else like that. Like, you know, someone who who doesn't have the ability to do stuff. If there's one of those abilities was bad, you'd be almost feeble in that particular aspect of your character. Um, so, you know, you get to figure that the average ability score that you could roll, you'd roll 5d10 to generate your ability scores. And that means the average ability score was around 26, if I remember correctly. And... Um, so you get a figure. We would take that ability score if it was a single ability for the weapon that you're but that you're using. Let's say, for example, a strength based weapon, and you would double it. So example would be if I had a twenty six strength, now I would have a fifty two starting for that skilled ability, and that means with percentile dice, this is where our brains went crazy. We would have to roll under that ability in order for us to have a successful hit. So example. I rolled, I have a 52 in, uh, you know, kind of ability score to start with a zero based skill. So I've just learned, I'm a novice at the skill. I have a 52% chance to hit once. Okay, that's how it goes. Now, if I wanted to hit more than once, there would be a challenge. I think we, I think if I'm not wrong, Mark, it was like uh, minus 30 or minus 20 or something like that for the second hit. And so, you know, it became very challenging. There's a very low chance you could hit twice. Um, and again, this is just a combat system. And it worked the same way. One thing we tried to do with our system is we tried to be consistent across um, all the skills that we that we had developed over, uh, you know, for the entire game. So very interesting. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. Times in our own year that people, languages, what languages were you able to speak? You know, going from country to country in the world of Conan, if you if you couldn't speak a language, you you know, you you might as well have a, a score of five, like you were saying. You're enfeebled. You're un unable to exist in that space. There's so much to take into consideration. So here's a question I have for you, Mark. Now, after we've talked about all these things, do you think the Conan game that we created back, you know, in the 90s, you know, um, do you think it would have, it would be enduring today? Do you think that um, some of the things we have here should be changed based on, you know, things we've learned, you know, over the, over the, the years now in terms of inclusiveness and accessibility and all those kind of things that we, you know, we've learned over the last 30 years, you know, as an example. Example, take a look at that character. See, we have race in there. And that's a real controversial item nowadays for Dungeons and Dragons. Should should there be a race in there? Is that really important? You know, as an example, that word is like loaded with um, with with potentially negative connotations. What are your thoughts around that? I, I totally understand. Um, I guess... It, it's a tough, it's a, that's a very specific and tough question to answer because, you know, I'm an old person, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> not quite a boomer, thankfully, but, but still, it's like, you know, when I look at a creature that it has, um, you know, seven eye stalks for a head, well, that's not a human. So it's a different race of creature or being. Uh, so I still think that it's important, but I think that there needs to be less 
uh, stereotype attached to that word within any gauge, like within any gauging system. And with respect to your first question, for you, and the second one, you know, with respect to endurability, uh, uh, or durability or enduring uh, play, I had a conversation with Daryl this evening while we were online playing Destiny, and he's ready to get going and out, dust it off, and start it again because. What? After all the systems that we play, he feels <laughs> that we did a, we made a system here that works damn well compared to everything else that's coming out, and up to and including fifth edition. Yeah, I agree with you. And you know the the funny thing about it is that um, you know one thing that we didn't do, guys, and this is something that I think is is something that I'm I I believe is uh, if we're going to dust it off again, uh, like uh, Mark and Daryl are saying. I think it needs to be published and um, taking it to that next level is, and we're, we're talking about publishing your games pretty soon, right? We're sitting here at third year. You're in your first semester of third year. Um, and one of the things that you need to have to differentiate yourself in the game industry is something that you've created, which is where GDW comes into play uh, side projects that you're doing and all those kind of things. And one thing that I've learned from, uh, from my time making games with, with, you know, the, the group of people that I do it with is it would have been awesome if we had produced something, even a hardcover, something that we could have done self-published that we could have made uh, back in those days, because it's something that, you know, something's been lost for all those times. We've made something, we, we played it, we have great memories and it affected uh, uh, all of our lives in terms of our, uh, of the creation process. Right. But it's something that we could have documented and we could have had, uh, you know, that, that we can carry forward. Um, there's a couple of comments here. Um, Jonathan says, uh, I think night vision and flight would work, but like when you attach certain things that make all tieflings be sneaky or a certain race more un unintelligent, it is very bad. And that's back to that race race comment uh, that we had before. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't have that. We didn't have a racial have bonus. Of... One thing you also mentioned, uh, and kind of before we wrap it up, um, is you mentioned moral codes. And we developed a moral code system. That's also pretty controversial, actually. Um, <clears throat> We, meant, we, we created a moral code system that replaced alignment. One of the things that uh, we found when it came to Dungeons and Dragons and the alignment is that it was so limiting. It was not, I would say, diverse enough, right, to really explain the behavior of a character. And there was no motivation necessarily behind having that alignment in play. I mean, it really limited you in D&D. That's all it did. It just said, like, I'm lawful good or I'm neutral good. And these are the things that I should or should not do based on my, my role playing, right? But the alignment system or the moral codes we put together, Mark, maybe you want to talk about it. What did it do for gameplay? Uh, I can be very, it's very current. I mean, I, I think that the moral code system that we put into play could be instantly translated to what you're seeing in the news of politicians globally today. You know, I mean, my this character sheet that I showed everybody, you know, one of the characters' of moral codes is piety, but also tyranny. You know, you can be a pious person and be tyrannical at the same time. And we see that in politicians around the world today. It was so realistic because people were going to have like they're going to like I was pious, a hero, and saintly, but also conniving and tyrannical. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. It's the kind of thing that it, it's realistic as opposed to just what, what are you on an axis of left, right, up, down? You know. Yeah. But you're right. Extremely limiting. 
this, there was so much more nuance and finesse. And that's why I said early on that, you know, we play tested this out because it is a thing of finesse. That's what moral codes are all about. It's about how do you finesse a situation with your skills, with your outlook, with what's happened to you in life, what you want out of life. You know, uh, one of the most uh, uh, prescient things I ever heard in my life was I was sitting at a bar uh, outside on a terrace, you know, writing scribbles in my notebook and a conversation at the table next to me when somebody said, in a world full of lies, what does an honest man do for a living? And it's these moral codes that we designed within this game system that gave us the flexibility to be realistic and enjoy, have fun, maybe be a little bad sometimes, but you know, able to play a game with a character that felt real, that we were like, I became so invested in Camus. Uh, well, okay, so last thing, last thing, absolutely last thing. Um, we talked about all the great things about the the experiences we had playtesting. Um, there was also some complexity with our game system. Our game system was not like D&D. d d is very straightforward, especially the latest version of d d 5. I would say it's the rules have really been reduced to kind of make it, make the game as efficient and as quick as possible based on, let's say, five five characters. Do you remember um, how long it took sometimes for our turns? <laughs> because, I mean, again, we had more complex rules. So that this is the negative thing. Uh, any comments on that? Well, It's hard to do that because, again, it's it's just the nuances. I mean, you know, one of the things that we lose when it comes to, uh, you know, playing digital, uh, uh, you know, compared with, you know, being, you know, playing a tabletop role playing game is the nuances that you lose. Right. I mean, you know, a lot of the times you're on autopilot. I mean, the game is is presenting you with with quests and you're responding to the game. I'm talking about the digital stuff. But the nuances of the role playing aspect, the things that you guys have experienced when you, when some of you, uh, when you were play testing your your encounters, the stuff that you put together with your assignment number one, and then play tested with assignment number two, as an example, um, you know, those nuances are lost a lot of times in our in on the digital side, and that's something that I would love uh, to be able to capture somehow. Maybe it's going to be with VR in the future. Uh, or maybe AR, augmented reality, or some other kind of uh, immersive experience. Because right now, the way role-playing games work is you have a persona, but again, the nuances of the actual role-playing game, even if you have some choices, they're pretty fixed, right? It's not like you can you have true agency, right? I know, wouldn't that be awesome? VR, chat, D&D. Or maybe there might be a professional DM. You know, a real professional DM. Maybe uh, Daryl will come online and and actually mediate or moderate an actual uh, game for thousands of people, not just uh, for uh, for for a few people around the table, right? So, on that note, uh, Mark, any last thoughts before uh, uh, we let you go? Thank you so much for for coming on board. By the way, I'm loving some of these little comments. Sounds like Mark with extra steps. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm not a LARPer. I will never LARP. You will never get me one. Are you sure? Um, <laughs> I won't, wouldn't be doing Warhammer 40k either, ever, Tom. Ever. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll nice see. Students to, to hold you to that. 
Uh, no, I don't have anything else to say. Just, I mean, obviously, and I don't know if anybody could tell, I'm very passionate about the idea of playtesting. I think it's so extremely important. Um, if you think that you're going to design a game and not uh, get anybody to, you know, test it out, you're just going to have a bunch of designers throw everything together and it's just going to be a wonderful thing. Best of luck to you. It's a, it's a lot of work and a lot of time and effort and passion. So just stay passionate about whatever idea it is that you have. All right, great. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us today. That's Mark uh, Samuel LeBlanc. He's uh, joined us for uh, just his views on playtesting, especially on across a tabletop role-playing game over the years. Thank you so much, Mark. Take care, Thomas. Bye, guys. All right. On that note, um, let us move back into our Or structure that we were talking about. So right now we've just finished that one. Uh, the in-class exercise that's due this Friday is based on user interface design and some of the the user experience um, heuristics that we're going to be talking about and learning about uh, during the lecture portion of this one. We're sitting at about 7:30, which is about an hour into our into our lecture. I'm going to stop recording here. We're going to take about five minutes just to reset, and we're going to get right into um, the next piece, which is your user experience design, um, as well as games, user research, and a bunch of the other topics that we haven't covered yet. Okay, so let's take a, a short uh, break. I'm going to stop recording this on YouTube, and we'll get back into the next piece, which is the next part of our lecture.